So, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to wel welcome you to our second installment of Israel and the Global South. This time we will shift our focus uh, to the relations between Israel and South Africa. I'm Patrick Waltz, the head of the State Office for Hessen uh, Rhineland Palatinate of the Friedrich Norman Foundation. And please bear with my nasal intonation as I'm suffering from a cold. The relations between South Africa and Israel are in a bad state, even if you are no expert on both countries, mm -hmm. reading the newspaper might give you a strong indication as um, the South African Republic has filed a case before the International Court of Justice accusing Israel of genocidal acts. So this is, um, well, quite a severe accusation. And the, what's the story behind this? Why did South Africa do this? What are or how are the relations between both countries? What's the historical explanations? And what factors are nowadays most relevant for this strained relationship? I'm really glad I don't have to tell you about this, but uh, we can uh, ask our two experts. Um, we first have uh, Professor Taman, uh, Tamar um, Brandes from the um, Faculty of Law from the ONU College in Tel Aviv. She will focus on the, um, the case um, against um, Israel at the ICJ. Thanks a lot for being with us, Professor uh, Brandes. And um, Christine Mundwa will um, speak to us uh, on the um, South African perspective mainly. Um, she's the journalist for Deutsche Welle. <laughs> At the moment, she's in Brussels. And um, thanks a lot, um, Ms. Mundwa, for um, shedding light on this topic from an African perspective. And um, everything Mike. will be held together by my colleague, Miklos Schumandi. He's um, project coordinator for Sub-Saharan Africa for the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. He's in Johannesburg at the moment, and um, he'll guide us through the evening. Miklos, thanks a lot for supporting us um, with you, uh, as a host. Thank you very much, very much, Patrick. And um, without further ado, I'll hand over to you and switch off my camera. I wish us um, many insights. If you have questions, please ask them in the F and A using the F and A button at the bottom of the toolbar, and we will try to um, fit them in in the this, into the discussion or um, take them up at the end of the discussion. So, Niklas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, it is a big pleasure to 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 be able to discuss this. Um, well, I think it is not not a secret, right? South African and Israel relations are a little bit strained ever since South Africa brought forward this court case at the ICJ. So today I would like to actually, before we delve deeper into the subject matter of the court case and its implications, uh, I would like to have a little bit of a chat with you, Christine, first. Um, let's talk a little bit about South Africa and Israel relations, simply because it is actually quite interesting. So when you look back at the history, right, uh, after 1948, after the Second World War, South Africa and Israel yeah. used to have quite good relations, uh, have used to have quite close relations, and all of this changed then after 1994. So I was wondering, could you give us a little bit of a rundown uh, in terms of history and how these relationships between the two countries have evolved? Yeah, thanks, Miklos, and uh, it's it's really good to be part of this conversation because, you know, it's such an intriguing story, South Africa-Israel relations over the years, and you can really maybe perhaps start, you've given us a date there, 1948, and this is when we officially have uh, an apartheid state uh, in South Africa. But if you perhaps consider the fact that South Africa was really one of the first countries to recognize uh, a, a, an independent Israel, this is of course after that decision by the United Nations to grant Israel a state. So South Africa is a big supporter of that for a number of reasons. Um, there are pro-Zionist um, sort of like leaders uh, within South Africa, but you also have 
a considerable sort of Jewish community in South Africa. Many of them uh, had come from Eastern uh, Europe and they've settled in South Africa. Many of them affiliate with the sort of uh, Zionist ideology. And so they are strong supporters of the state of Israel. And what we see at the time is these uh, relations are, are pretty cordial, but then sort of you've got a change in South Africa where it goes to leadership is handed over to the National Party. And by the way, the National Party had had a problem image-wise because many of its leaders were actually anti-Semites and they had been uh, on the record as, as, as Nazi sympathizers, but they sort of over time, uh, wash off that image. They embrace uh, the Jewish community in South Africa, so to say, and they become very strong supporters of the state of Israel. But it gets awkward at a point because this association with South Africa for the Israelis is a bit of a problem because of the image, right? Um, certain Israeli leaders are on record as, as being embarrassed by the affiliation. And, and in the 1950s and 60s, we actually see that Israel is very vocal against the apartheid regime. It's difficult, and 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 Israel is actually at that time uh, trying to 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 make inroads on the African continent, right? Um, and and that stops working at a point because what the oil rich Gulf states do is they get involved and they start pressuring African countries not to affiliate with Israel, right? And they threaten, you know, the classic, you know will cut the economic ties. And so a lot of African countries start veering away uh, from Israel. And at that point, um, Israel is sort of like losing ground uh, on the African continent. It also sort of coincides with the time where the African liberation movements are strengthening. Uh, and all over the continent, you've got these strong uh, liberation movements um, fighting for independence. And so South Africa becomes increasingly isolated. And then we start seeing relations between Israel and South Africa strengthening, and we start hearing about this cooperation. Now we're talking about the 1970s, et cetera. We start seeing uh, stronger ties again, this cooperation, uh, because these two states now see themselves very similar. This is apartheid South Africa and the state of Israel. They're having problems with their neighbors, uh, uh, South Africa certainly fears an attack from its neighbors um, because of the, the the liberation movements. There's an insurgency within the country, right? Uh, the African National Congress has now taken up arms. So this is, it's waging and a, a, an armed conflict. So there is an interest now on the part of South Africa uh, to strengthen itself militarily. And we see that it seeks the help of Israel in this very uh, ambition. So a lot of the relations around that time is South Africa and Israel um, cooperating militarily. Now we have to point out that, I, I'm sure we can get into this conversation, but a lot of that military cooperation is, is shrouded in secrecy. Uh, it wasn't made public. In fact, military agreements that were signed between Israel and apartheid South Africa are, are classified uh, as secrets. Right, that it should never be known that we are cooperating, but we can we can talk a little bit about the extent to that cooperation. But what I what I want to initially leave you with is this picture of um, at times marriage of inconvenience, right? Because um, the National Party, for, from what I gathered and, and talking and reading some, some sort of like is is really um, um, narratives on this is it was it wasn't always. Some it wasn't always um, how can I put it? I think I use the word embarrassing. You know, for to some extent, um, people in Tel Aviv did not like the association uh, with the South African government at the time, right? And I told you about the nineteen fifties and the nineteen sixties, where Israel had been a very vocal critic of apartheid. But at some point, they find themselves in 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 a situation where they have a lot in common, right? The, the challenge with the neighbors, the the, the needing to, to beef up militarily. Uh, and then, of course, on the basis of that, the diplomatic relations are strengthened and we start seeing various level of cooperation. Much of it would be later revealed, the extent of this cooperation when the new government in an apartheid, uh, um, a democratic South Africa where the ANC declassifies certain government records and we start seeing uh, a bigger picture of that cooperation, if, 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 you, if that makes sense for now.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you just threw out something which I find very interesting, a marriage of, in, of, of, of inconvenience, right? So here I would like to ask you, are we just talking about a marriage in a political sense? Or was there also an economic dimension to it? How were the economic relations between Israel and South Africa just about the time that you mentioned around the 1970s and how have they evolved? Yeah, so I mean, today, interestingly, and I want to start with today, um, I, the, South Africa and Israel have significant trade. And it, it's part of the reason why uh, the ANC's stance uh, on the issue um, is particularly difficult. It's part of the reason why um, you know, people are pressuring the South African government, uh, the ANC, to to do more in terms of severing ties with Israel. But that's a very difficult thing to do economically because of the benefit. But certainly those economic relations start around that time. So there's military cooperation, but there's also, um, like you say, economic ties, right, particularly in the area of minerals. And I have to point out that you also have this um, – thriving, I would say, Jewish community in South Africa. They uh, are known to even uh, send money uh, back home to to Israel, to the state of Israel in support of the state of Israel. So you start seeing those economic ties um, coming out. Remember, for South Africa, it needed um, uh, markets to be able to export uh, its minerals. South Africa is a mineral-rich country. So a lot of that is ties uh, around that. Um, of course, the military aspect, as we say, there's secrecy around that, but we certainly see that there are growing, uh, deepening uh, economic ties between South Africa and Israel. That all is forced to a halt when the Americans in 1986, I believe it is, pressure Tel Aviv to take to adopt sanctions uh, on, on South Africa. So certainly uh, deepening ties. And of course, as I say, the pressure for Israel to then take sanctions on uh, South Africa comes from Washington, uh, who effectively doesn't give Israel a choice in the matter. But before that, they establish uh, good uh, sort of um, export uh, relationships, trade relationships, where we see the back and forth of goods um, uh, between the two countries. You mentioned sanctions. <clears throat> so, of course, we are talking about a time when South Africa actually on an international level had precious little um, allies, right? So Israel was one of the few of them. So the introduction of sanctions and also Israel carrying this sanction regime against South Africa, what uh, what what did it change in terms of, of, of the economy in South Africa? How did South Africa actually cope? Yeah. Well, we start to see that that's the beginning of the end, right? Because those sanctions are incredibly effective. Um, and that is basically what brings apartheid down, not just Israel's sanctions in particular, but all the sanctions, because it becomes unsustainable uh, from a financial perspective and economic perspective to continue. And that forces the National Party uh, to, to go into talks and, and we see the end of apartheid. So economic sanctions were really effective. And now if you can imagine that you can't trade with your neighbors, right, in the African continent. Um, international Western allies have, uh, have abandoned you at this stage. And now, um, you know, your, your one ally, or not your one, but certainly a significant ally can no longer trade with you and has had to impose sanctions. So that really you start to see, because we're talking about 1986, um, and then already by early 1990s, it's clear that this is, is, is no longer sustainable. And we have uh, new leaders um, who come in, and we basically say, right, we are now preparing for what is a transition because we can no longer sustain what we're doing. So it is uh, significant. But I perhaps want to maybe highlight, um, so in parallel to uh, apartheid South Africa's cooperation with the state of Israel, the African National Congress um, has a very strong alliance with the PLO, the Palestinian Authority. And here you see Yasser Arafat, for example, um, helping the African National Congress the, get money uh, for its armed struggle. Uh, Yasser Arafat is assisting in, in terms of helping uh, the, 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 the MK uh, fighters to get training. He's going around and he's lobbying uh, Middle Eastern countries for money. He's also asked by the head of the ANC at that time, Oliver Tambo, to actually be the custodian of the funds. So very, very, very strong ties are, are, are forging uh, between the PLO 
and the African National Congress, which has now taken arms. And so I think I once read a scholar who said you could sort of see like this was now the 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 third world alliance, basically. Fast forward to today and, and look at what's, where South Africa is aligning itself, right? Look at how which countries have been adopted into the BRICS family. And you can almost see, say that history is repeating itself. So that's a big part of the story because that explains South Africa's position today under the ANC government, right? The, the Palestinian Authority was very instrumental. Um, and in fact, so much so that when Nelson Mandela is released from prison, one of the first people he meets is Yasser Arafat, who travels to Zambia uh, to meet him. And we see uh, throughout uh, Mandela's remaining years, he remains a strong advocate uh, for the Palestinian cause. Um, and that is a, an official ANC position. That explains the vote in Parliament last November, where the Parliament says, we vote uh, in favour of severing ties with Israel uh, until such time as there is a ceasefire in the conflict. Of course, that's not been acted upon, and we'll get into that conversation. But I just want you to understand that the Palestinian Authority, specifically the Fatah faction headed up by Yasser Arafat, was so um, important a supporter for the African National Congress in its fight um, against uh, the system of apartheid. It had now taken up arms and it needed the resources to be able to execute that operation. What you mentioned before is very interesting. So you mentioned that the ANC had personal relationships. Mandela with Yasser Arafat, and there were others. And as a matter of fact, my understanding is that <clears throat> South Africa and even its neighboring countries, right? If we talk about Zimbabwe, if we talk about Sanu PF, there are all these yeah. relations dating back to the time of the struggle against apartheid, the end of colonial uh, colonialism, and so on. So how is it these days? Because most of the, the generation, right, that actually lived through the struggle against apartheid uh, for freedom, they are vanishing, they are dying out. Yeah. So is this level of personal connections between ANC and other organizations, is it still on the same level or is it diminishing? I want to make sure I've understood you correctly. The, the cooperation between ANC and other sort of like liberation movements exactly. on the continent. Yes. Yes. Oh, and I would absolutely, and I would argue much to the detriment of democracy. Um, and 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 uh, I want to single out uh, ANC and ZANU PF in particular, because of this historical alliance, the African National Congress has not been able to really stand up and condemn the ZANU-PF government in Zimbabwe for, for violations of human rights, right? And I think, you know, these are brothers in arms. Still today, they refer to one another as, as comrades. So to a point where they're not able to call each other out and take definitive actions. I mean, you will never almost have a world where an ANC can 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 put sanctions on Zimbabwe for, for, for turning the guns on, on people, right? We've had rigged elections in Zimbabwe. We, had, we have had blatant violations of, of, of human rights, etc., that the South African government has had to tread softly over, and it is because of these historic ties. But I think one of the things I want to mention here, sorry, and this is not particularly to your question, but I, I want people to understand, I talked about the Jewish community that was present in South Africa uh, during the time of apartheid. Uh, yes, you had a lot of um, people within the community who, who supported the apartheid regime. And I think we, we have to understand this from a, from a psychological perspective as well. These people have fled a place in the world where, they, where they're under attack. They come to South Africa. They're classified as white people, so they're embraced. Um, so naturally, it's understandable that they, they, they sympathize to, to the status quo. But within that community, you have very strong anti-apartheid um, activists within the South African Jewish community. And one name rings to me, Dennis Goldberg, right? This, him and six others were in the dock uh, when Nelson Mandela was sentenced to life in prison, albeit by a, 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 a Jewish prosecutor. It was a Jewish prosecutor whose name uh, escapes my memory, who actually then sentences Mandela and uh, the others to, 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 um, to life in prison for 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 um, treason and uh, and other things, but you know uh, some of Mandela's comrades in arms, at least five of those, were Jewish nationals, and these people were actually ostracized by the the official voice 
of the Jewish community in South Africa, you had what you call the board of directors. And the board of directors actually distanced itself from the likes of Dennis Goldberg, these very strong anti-apartheid activists who were active in, in helping the, the ANC. They were not all ANC members, some were with the Communist Party, etc. But they were strongly fighting against the system of apartheid. And as a result, they were sort of ostracized uh, from the, the 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 voice of the Jewish community in South Africa, the board of directors. So in that narrative, um, you cannot uh, say, you cannot not say that there were strong uh, um, anti-apartheid activists in the Jewish community because there absolutely was. But yes, coming back to the liberation movements, um, we have a real big challenge, there, especially uh, in, 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 in South Africa and Zimbabwe. These parties have stayed too long. They've become the villains, right? They are now arguably perpetrating um, injustices, right? They have not delivered uh, on the promise, yet they feel very entitled. And I think you'll see that as these you know, young generations are coming up who don't necessarily know apartheid, who don't know the struggle. Um, I was born in Zimbabwe and I grew up in a democratic South Africa, right? We hear the tales, we, this was dictated to us, uh, in 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 the textbooks, etc. We we have a strong sense of what apartheid was, um, but that's not enough for us to excuse uh, the people in power from making uh, the right decisions. So certainly, young people, a whole new generation now of Zimbabweans and South Africans, uh, would be looking at the situation from a very different lens. Although these movements um, are still closely affiliated to the point that um, it's difficult for them to call each other out. Uh, you just touched upon it before, and I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. Um, some some people argue that the ANC has lost the moral high ground, if you can put it in this way. So how do you actually reconcile this? Um, South Africa bringing forward this court motion. What is the motivation? And is it really purely a sense of being having gone through the same history that Palestinians have done, or is there something else to it as well? So I think one thing that we can say is, I think someone once said, oh, you know, South Africa's foreign policy, in a nutshell, in, in ANC government foreign policy, very inconsistent, unclear, and that's true. Um, but one thing that the ANC has been consistent about is its support for the Palestinian cause. Um, and that is absolutely true. Um, it is in uh, the ANC DNA, so to say. And I explained, you know, the support that the Palestinians uh, uh, gave uh, to South Africa, the PLO specifically, um, during South Africa's struggle. Mandela famously said, and, and we're, we're seeing this quote come up on social media quite a bit now, that, you know, we are not free. We haven't achieved our full freedom until, um, you know, our brothers and sisters in, in, in Palestine are free. So... There is absolutely evidence, right, from the very beginning. And and actually, as soon as the ANC comes into power, Mandela's government, relations with Israel are cordial, but you start to see the, t the ties sort of deteriorating. Why? Because South Africa's um, relationship with, with the Palestinian authorities, et cetera, it, it picks up. So naturally, these things have a difficulty coexisting. So much to the detriment of the, the relations between uh, South Africa. And then over the years, it, it just gets absolutely worse. So the ANC has been consistent in that, in terms of its support and its feeling that uh, the people of Palestine um, experience now what we experience during apartheid. You've heard South Africa's foreign minister say this, um, even at places like the UN, right, where she says, we, we strongly identify with what's going on in, in Palestine because this is what was was done to us. So there is there is that aspect uh, to it. And I'll actually have you know that some people, people who are massively pro-Palestinian, think that the ANC isn't doing enough, right? For example, um, the South African parliament that uh, took a decision last November uh, to cut ties uh, with Israel, to, to sever ties, to effectively close the Israeli embassy, um, that motion was brought by an opposition party um, and the ANC uh, voted in support of that. Um, it had a, a huge majority, I think 250 votes to, to like 90 votes, a huge majority. I mean, the ANC then, of course, added that sentence to say until such time as there is a ceasefire. But 
that hasn't happened, right? That, that Because that decision ultimately gets carried out by the president who hasn't done it. And you have people in the pro-Palestinian movement in South Africa today, which is a very strong movement, by the way, saying to the president, you're not doing enough on this. You're not taking a tougher stance. I mean, there are South Africans absolutely calling for a complete severing of ties, never mind just around the war. Remember, in 2022, right, South Africa already, by the foreign ministry, declared Israel to be an apartheid state and asked the UN General Assembly to look into the merits of that. So it's interesting because the ANC is finding itself in this place where it, it's, it in itself has become more right-wing. It, it's leaning more to the right now, so the ANC, and it's having to balance economic interests uh, with, of course, this, one could call it this this moral uh, uh, obligation that, that some people, certainly within the organization, feel it has. So this is the challenge that the ANC has where you have people in the groups calling for, you know, the, the, the BDS um, measures, right? The boycotting, the divestment, the sanctions. And the president's not done that. And there's no indication that he will because of what's at stake from an economic perspective, if, if that sort of answers your question. Absolutely. Um, there are just a couple of things I would really like to touch upon rather briefly. Um, so we have talked uh, we have talked about the whole international perspective, right? We, uh, political relationship between Israel and, and South Africa. But I would also like to talk just a little bit about the society. So the South mm -hmm. African population supports South Africa's motion at the ICJ, right? So if I if I may just ask really, you know, in a in a provocative fashion, are South Africans anti-Israel? Well, are South Africa and I think anti-Israel, mm, maybe that's a bit of a stretch. I let's let's say for sure pro-Palestinian. And it's worth always reminding ourselves about the demographics in South Africa where north of 70% of the population are black South Africans, right? Um, who Whose understanding of what is going on in Israel may not be um, to the absolute detail, but are able to say, oh, what's happening to, to people in, in, in Palestine is what happened to our people, right? So this this simple conclusion. So look, like I said, we have, we have a, 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 a strong pro-Palestinian movement in the country. We also have a significantly sized um, Muslim community in, in, in South Africa. And I think perhaps there you will find more extreme views, so to say, and you will possibly find anti-Israel uh, views. But I think the average South African is more pro-Palestinian than they are anti-Israel. And certainly even the loudest voices uh, who are calling for stronger action to be taken against Israel will say we are our issue is not with the Jewish people. Our issue is with the state of Israel, which which is is something you will hear from, for example, your Julius Malemas. These are really loud voices uh, in the country right now who have huge platforms. As social media has also extended that. Um, so I perhaps would 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 put it that way. Look, we have our our Jewish uh, schools in South Africa, we have our synagogues. And I don't know that these places need the kind of security that they are afforded in a place like Germany, right? It's it's not my experience that you've got to guard these places to the extent that you have to um, in, in other parts of the world. Um, I I don't, in my reporting years, I, I never had to do a story about anti-Semitic attacks um, in, in South Africa. So that propels me to say that the issue necessarily um, is not, um, you know, sort of we're anti-Israel, but certainly we're pro-Palestinian. Um, and then, of course, there would be absolutely sure in certain quarters, but it wouldn't be a, a wide, it wouldn't be a, a mainstream view. Thank you, Christine. Um, at this point, I would like to bring in uh, Professor Brandes. Um, so we, we mentioned at the beginning one, one of the reasons why this whole uh, Israel-South Africa relationship issue is all over the news and keeps popping up in the news is the ICJ court case. 
uh, when Pretoria brought this court case, it was limited rather narrowly, right? So we are talking about genocide, um, but maybe you can just break it down for us, Professor Brandes, for um, non-lawyers, why South Africa structured the case as it did, and what is the Israeli side to the story? Good, thank you. Um, so actually, it was fascinating uh, listening to Christine, and I want to actually um, connect before I start talking about uh, about the ICJ uh, case um, and to what what was said before and kind of highlight the differences because when we talk about a legal case you know then we talk about the legal claim and whether the legal requirements are fulfilled or not fulfilled and we talk about you know questions that may sound boring like whether there's jurisdiction and whether there's intent and what you need to prove and this is what the legal case is about um, but I think that actually at the background of this is a much larger issue, um, which we also see in response to the case, but in South, in the case of Israel, South Africa, is actually, I mean, actually preceded the case, right? We were talking about 2022, about 2021, about issues that came up long before the question of whether what Israel was doing in Gaza today, you know, amounted to violation of international law, and if so, which types of violation of international law. And I think that part of the problem from my perspective is the framing of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in terms of settler colonialism or in terms of um, apartheid, whereas it doesn't fit nicely into those categories. Okay, there are a lot of issues, but I think part of the difficulty is to say, well, we have this framework of thought which is very dominant now also in universities, also in American universities, which we see everything through the prism of colonialism. So either you know you're oppressor or you're an oppressed. Either you're a set, you know, you're a colonizer or you're a colonized. Well, I don't think the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which has a lot of issues um, in it, fits nicely into this framework. Some parts of it may, but not, as, but not, it, but in generally, it doesn't. It's much, much more complex than that. And that also ties back, you know, to the point where you say, okay, you know, there are a lot, a lot of South Africans are generally pro-Palestinians, but my question would be, well, are pro-Palestinians pro-Hamas? Is it the same thing? Like when we say pro-Palestinians, does that equate pro-Hamas? Because that's a completely, you know, that that's arguably a different thing, you know, to say whether you're pro-Palestinian or pro-Hamas. So I think that's something to touch on. Now, in terms of the ICJ case, from Israel's perspective, this is not about the relationship between South Africa and Israel. Of course, it's in the background. But when South Africa brings the genocide case to the ICJ, it's not invoking the rights of South Africans. It's not invoking the right, its own rights. It's invoking the case in the name of you know the ent entire world. Like the doctrine that allows South Africa to bring the case to the ICJ is because when we're talking about crimes like genocides or acts like genocide, from the legal doctrine, any country could have brought this case to the court. And the court, in order for the court to even, you know, have jurisdiction over the case, there needs to be an anchor. Now, the anchor for the court's jurisdiction in this case is the Genocide Convention. Now, the Genocide Convention is the convention of both Israel and South Africa are parties to. And under the Genocide Convention, states have consented to the jurisdiction of the ICJ with respect to possible violations of the Genocide Convention. Now, this is very important because this is the anchor to jurisdiction. So if you're asking me, well, why didn't South Africa, you know, prosecute Hamas if it's so worried, even set the politics aside, if it's so worried about, you know, human rights, and even if it weren't for political reasons, what my, what my answer would be, well, the court doesn't have jurisdiction over Hamas because it's not a party to the genocide. Even Palestine is not a party to the Genocide Convention. Palestinian Authority is not a party to the Genocide Convention. So there are very, this like legalese issues which may sound, you know, not as interesting as the political stuff, but without them, the court simply cannot operate. And this also has to do with the nature of the of the law of, of the of the case. The ICJ has jurisdiction over genocide because the source of jurisdiction is the Genocide Convention. So the ICJ doesn't have jurisdiction over war crime. It doesn't have jurisdiction over other violations of international law. If had South Africa wanted to, you know, bring a case against Israel for um, um, violation of international humanitarian law, it couldn't have done so because there's no source for jurisdiction. So the source for jurisdiction is the Genocide Convention, which means that everything has to be looked upon through, you know, the prism of, of genocide, because this is the only thing the court can decide upon. 
this is the only actually violation of international law in this context that the courts has jurisdiction over. And then it colors, you know, the entire case, the entire the entire public debate, because we could discuss or of whether or not, you know, Israel's actions are compliant with international law of war. We could have that discussion, but the ICJ can't have discussion because it doesn't have jurisdiction to have that discussion. And we could, you know, um, talk, we could discuss, you know, very specific um, acts, for example, eviction of uh, of, um, of civilians, you know, whether or not eviction is civil is 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 uh, is permitted under international law of war and, and under what circumstances and whether at some point it becomes, you know, a violation of international law. All these are, you know, legitimate questions, but they don't fall within the court's jurisdiction. The court's jurisdiction is with respect to genocide. So this frames, you know, the entire way in which we have to look at the case. Now, genocide is a very, very specific, you know, legal violation. When we're talking about genocide, we're talking about the intent, you know, acts taken in order to destroy in whole or in part, you know, a national, religious, ethnic group, and et cetera. So basically the, the ability to, to prove whether or not acts constitute genocide, they're centered around the question of intent. And this is the main dispute in the court, right? In the South African case, so the South African case is, is based on the claim or on the premise that Israel intends to destroy the Palestinian people, that the you know very large number of civilian casualties in Gaza, you know, are are a result of an intention to destroy the Palestinian people. Where Israel's claim in the court was that there are a lot of civilian casualties, but the large number of civil civilian casualties are a result of the manner of warfare within Gaza are a result of the fact that Hamas operates from within a very densely populated population. Um, and, you know, Israel showed in the case uh, pictures and videos, you know, of missiles, you know, fired from within, you know, hospitals, kindergartens, you know, very populated question. But that's, you know, the kind of legal question that I think gets lost in the larger political, you know, debate on who's the villain, who's good, who's good and who's evil here, right? Who's who's the villain? And I think the legal um, discourse is very different in this respect from um, the political discourse and even just from the interest of, you know, m most people, because people look and say, well, you know, a lot of innocent people are killed. So we don't really care what, what, what happened before, what we want to stop this, um, which I think is a very natural and understandable response. But from a legal perspective, it does matter whether you know this is an intended intended policy or whether this is something else and by the way that something else could be a violation of international law i don't have enough information to be able to tell you this seriously as an international lawyer you know as an international lawyer if you ask me well is this attack legal i would have to tell you i need to see you know what was the target you know what were the calculated what was the information i can't just offhand say whether it was or whether it wasn't legal based on the number of people that you know, I just don't have that that we're killed. I don't have the information, but this is very different, you know, from the debate that we are having um, at the background of 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 this entire case. And I think, for example, that a lot of people are unaware of the fact that this case is about genocide because the ICJ only has jurisdiction over genocide. And this is why we're not talking about other possible issue violations of international law that may be relevant here, maybe more relevant here, you know, than the violation of genocide. And of course, genocide has, and you have to say that this, you know, the moral stain that um, is very much tied to the Jewish history, to the Holocaust, to this narrative of, you know, victims of genocide and, you know, now being accused of genocide. So obviously, you know, this is not a legal issue, but you can't detach it, you know, if we're talking about a historical narrative um, from, from the bigger story in which, you know, Israel is accused of, um, of genocide and how that accusation is perceived here. I mean... Uh, thank you. Uh, there is one thing actually for the benefit of our viewers that I would like to discuss with you. Um, we had a talk about this a couple of days ago, right? And you made the argument, you told me that for you as a lawyer, for humanitarian lawyers, the court case 
of South Africa was actually counterproductive. Can you tell us again why? Well, I think for two, two reasons. First, because it's a case it's a case around you know it's it's about genocide um, where intent where you have to prove that basically all of Israel's actions are calculated intent um, to 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 destroy you know the Palestinian people, um, and because we're focusing on that, then you know it basically colors the entire international law arena as an arena that's very hostile to Israel, very unfair to Israel, doesn't recognize October 7th, you know, and I want to talk a little bit about October October 7th in, in, in a second. And, and and when you try, you know, to, to even within Israel, to bring in critical voices that talk about, you know, the duty of Israel to, uh, to, to, to supply humanitarian aid into Gaza. Um, or when you talk about, you know, within Israel, about compliance with IHL and what Israel has to do, then it's very easy to kind of put it all aside as well, inter the international law and international institutions, they're all anti-Israel to begin with. So there's no point of even trying to be part of this uh, of this conversation. Um, but I think that what was very, very clear also in, in the South African application to the ICJ was that Hamas was not just not there in the narrative. Um, which you know, from an Israeli perspective, I mean, it's it's if you open it, it's in it's in the bypassing. You know, there's a bypassing reference to October seventh. You know, something like yes, it will happen, and we're generally we're generally against you know the taking of hostages, and we're generally against human rights violation. But for from an Israeli perspective, October seventh has invoked um, a national trauma, an existential fear that is just not there you know i mean I, I'm, I'm going to go to a personal level but you know i have a, i had a student we had a student in our law school um tamar Guzman, who was you know murdered at the nova festival they didn't find her body for days she was shot she was then burnt you know her family for weeks you know searched for her remains eventually they found two of her bones they identified her through you know dna testing as parts of body parts with which within which one can't live you know and then they determined her death and you know that is just not in the 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 South African application to the ICJ, you know, and and I think that's counterproductive because from an Israeli perspective, this was a denial of what happened here on October seven, and um, which is not something that happened in the past. It's something that is still ongoing because we still have hostages in Gaza. You know, just yesterday, um, a UN report was published regarding the sexual you know, sexual uh, violence that um, Hamas perpetrated in Israel upon Israeli victims in uh, on October 7th, with, you know, indications that there are very good reasons to think that Israel hostages are still going through sexual violence as we speak, you know, in these very minutes. So also, you know, this framing of, well, October 7th happened in the past, but, you know, that's bygones and we've moved on. And now we're talking about what Israel, the suffering that Israel is inflicting in Gaza. It just doesn't resonate with reality here. And here again, it's counterproductive because if your own pain and suffering is denied, then it's very difficult to recruit people, you know, to, to a conversation in which in, in which in in in, in, which, in which their the violations of their rights um is not recognized. I mean, there are, you know, dozens of thousands of Israelis that are not in their hometowns. People are evicted from the north, from the south. There are missiles from Hezbollah every day. So we are in a war. And that reality um, is something that I think is absent from this larger narrative of, well, you know, there's colonizers and colonizers, and it's just not there. Um, and I think in, in that sense, it's, it's counterproductive. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I would like to bring in now a little bit the German perspective or a question relating to Germany. So we have many countries, right, um, that have voiced their support for South Africa when it came to the ICJ case. Other countries have, have voiced the, the position on, on, on the Israeli side, and one of them was Germany. So Germany said that it would intervene on Israel's behalf at the ICJ. Um, from a legal point of view, what does that mean? What does that entail? Can you explain this? I, to be honest, I don't think. I mean, I think this is mostly a political. The, these are these the, the the strength of these are in terms of political support. I think that also from a South African perspective, this was very much about the interim measures 
because the final case, you know, is this decision could be years from now and the practical implications of it are maybe, I mean, they may be politically relevant, but they're not relevant now. Um, so I think what South Africa was trying to get here was more, you know, interim measures, warrants, um, which it received some of them. Um, but I, but I think that you know the 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 siding of states with South Africa or you know with Israel is more the way I see it a political you know aligning politically which 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 part of the narrative here um, than it has actual legal implication whether and to what extent it may influence the judges it might I mean it it may it may have weight in the sense that you know. But that's, you know, a guessing game. I, I never like to guess what influence just, but it may have, you know, it may impress the judges, you know, that countries come and intervene on behalf of Israel. Um, but I have to say that for me as an Israeli, of course, we're worried about, you know, the end game and the, and the case and the final decisions. But we're living on a day to day basis here now. So it's really more about what would be the implications now. Um, which are more seem more relevant at the moment, you know, than why what might happen um, might happen years from now. I'm I'm guessing, you know, it might have some effect on the judges that um, that countries intervene, and also in terms, you know, the, if, but even the interim measures they're still ongoing um, because I mean one of the the main warrant that South Africa requested, um, which was. Um, to cease all military activities was was, was rejected, um, but the court did deliver warrant. It delivered warrant request requiring Israel um, to take firm actions against incitement to genocide, and it delivered warrants um, requiring Israel to provide humanitarian aid into Gaza. Um, and I think it has to be said, you know, the, the humanitarian situation is Gaza, in Gaza is very very concerning. I am very very concerned, you know, as from the uh, from the humanitarian situation in Gaza. Um, again, I don't think the right framing for it is the genocide framing, um, but I think that there, you know, that there is a case for Israeli response for Israel responsible to Gaza. And you know, I'm raising that voice here within Israel, also saying Israel is responsible. You know, to to what to has responsibility and has to make sure that the situation there is taking that people are taking care of, and that the situation is not deteriorated. Again, whether it's helpful that this is all framed under genocide. I don't think that it's the most helpful framing of 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 the problem, um, but it might have effect. That I don't know. I mean, the fact that they were warned and that Israel has to deliver a report might have actual effects in terms of you know getting to action. Israel filed its report. It was not published. It was not published here. It was not published. Um, I think it, 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 uh, internationally. So I don't know what was reported and what was not. And also we have to remember, and I'm going to finish it, that there's a very there's also a gap in Israel between the public discourse, what is said in public in Israel, and what the government is doing. Um, because the Israeli government is a very right-wing government, which speaks to its own electorate. So, you know, we've already had in Israel, you know, incidents where, you know, we had ministers saying, oh, we will not open the water to Gaza. And then it found out that the military has opened water. We will not let aid in. And then the military it was found out that it was let in. So if you ask me from a factual perspective, how much I know of what is actually going on, it's very, very difficult for me to tell you what I think actually is going on. Of course, I'm very concerned. I think everyone who cares about human rights should be very concerned. The situation is not good. Thank you, Professor Brandes. At this point, um, I would like to bring Christine in again. Uh, the the ICJ case, how has it affected the relationships between uh, South Africa and Israel? Has it become much worse or is it just continually at the same level? And uh, with a look at the time, so I would like to encourage our viewers also to ask us questions. We have received a few questions and with my question, Christine, to you, I am going to uh, well bring forward a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, which is slightly provocative. Doesn't South Africa have its own problems? Why is it taking up a position against Israel together with on, on, on behalf of, of Palestine, uh, Palestinians? 
and uh, related to the whole positioning of South Africa on the international level, international uh, uh, level, yes, um, where does South Africa stand in terms of Russia, Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Okay, thanks, Miklos. I'll try and put that all together. Um, uh, and thanks so much, uh, Prof. Uh, Tamar. I think that was really and sort of just making us understand. I know I, I've dressed the part of what would look like a legal representative, but I <laughs> I have a lot to learn myself. I'm by no means an expert on that bit, but thank you so much. Um, yeah, so the, the, tri the ties, um, I would say, have strained over the years. Um, and that's perhaps also due to the, the constellation of uh, the, the government in Israel, which is incredibly right-wing uh, at this time. Um, I know that the South African president has, has engaged uh, the heads of uh, sort of like the, the Jewish groups, and he's made it clear that you know he will continue to advocate for for the Palestinian cause and and just to address the question coming in from one of our audience members there I think you 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 really have to understand that you know we have this rift between the global north and the global south right now and you have the feeling um, among people in 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 the global south it's I don't like the term global south but I think you know which part of the world I'm talking about um, that. We, we don't, that it's not an equal, uh, we're not on the equal footing, that it's not a level playing field, that we continue to receive unfair treatment on a number of issues. And so the Global South is really um, 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 acting out at this point. And you saw it with the issue, uh, so I don't want to call it an issue, but the war with Russia and Ukraine and how uh, many countries in the Global South refuse to join Western countries in, in, in taking part in the sanctions against Russia. We saw it at, at the votes at the UN Security Council, countries like South Africa opting to remain neutral and not getting on board that. So these two issues um, are an opportunity for people to again come out and say, we don't, we, we don't agree with, with what you're doing. So it's being conflated. And on their own, these two issues um, have very specific dynamics, but what they've done is really just open up this conversation again about how we're not all equal, right? And so people look at what's going on in Gaza and are able to almost, I don't I, I don't want to, to, to say what people are doing, please don't misunderstand me, but the reason why October 7, um, for a lot of people, goes like this, and I'm trying to say it, it flashes by, is because people are now equating what is happening in yeah. Gaza now to, to what people feel has been decades of treatment towards people of the global south. So we we are in a, in a, in a time where we really need leadership. Um, we absolutely need leadership. And it's interesting because the African National Congress, the ANC, has thought of itself as as wanting to be a mediator between the Palestinian people and the in the and the is, is Israeli government. I mean, it supports the idea of a two state solution, and at some point, it saw itself um, well positioned to be able to stand as, as mediator for that. Today, I'm not sure that 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 can happen uh, for a number of reasons because of the ICJ case and 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 what that now means in terms of how how the state of Israel views South Africa. But we are in a very difficult moment. And that, again, brings the question of what is really the motivation on the part of the African National Congress? And that is being questioned within the country as well, right? Uh, I've heard people say, where does the money come from for South Africa to be able to, 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 um, to, to even um, have this case uh, at, the, at the ICJ? But I think what people need to understand is, is this is now, we're, in, we're competing for narratives it's about alliances and there's a geopolitical factor to, element to all of this, which cannot be ignored. The global South uh, perhaps is, is, is trying to signal something to, to, to Western powers. And these conflicts um, are, 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 are providing sort of an opportunity for the global South to, to, to say what it wants to say. But of course, that comes to the casualty of what's really going on here and what needs to be salvaged. And all I can say is leadership is, is absolutely needed at this time.
uh, to, to bring the communities uh, together, so to say. Apologies, unmuting. You just briefly touched upon it. Um, there is another question that I would like to bring forward. Bettina Schmidt from Stuttgart asks, how is the relation between Iran and ANC at the present? At present, And is this also affecting the case? Certainly there are uh, theories circulating uh, within South Africa that Iran, uh, Tehran has sponsored this case uh, at the ICJ. You will know that uh, Iran applied to join the BRICS alliance. This is that alliance with Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And Iran is now uh, a member of that. One of the other things that the ANC has has long made its sort of, um, what can I say, a, um, part of its policy is it, it wants to break down the system of, of Western dominance, uh, this global system of Western dominance, hence wanting to be part of the BRICS alliance um, and hence, you know, uh, in, furthering ties with, with Russia and uh, and China. We've seen th these countries hold joint military drills, for example, one of them very unfortunately on the occasion of the first anniversary of the war in Ukraine. So one of the other problems was how the pandemic was handled, a very recent example of how the Western world missed in terms of how it it, it handled the pandemic, right? The vaccine hoarding, uh, the refusal to, to give the, the patents, all of these issues, again, propagated this narrative that when it comes down to it, we're on our own, that all this talk of partnership is empty talk. I heard African leaders say, you know, the Europeans cut all communication in the pandemic. They wouldn't even hold virtual summits with African leaders, right? So all of these things are now piling up. Uh, you heard the Indian foreign minister say, you know, when it's our problem, it's our problem. <laughs> but when it's the West problem, it, it's a global problem. So you now have a challenge where uh, there is this push uh, for, for, and I'm repeating myself here because this is really at the core of things. And this is then much to the detriment of people losing maybe sight and sympathy of what happened on October 7, losing sight and sympathy of what's happening to Ukrainians, because this is more of a backlash against the West, which you know, admittedly has made huge mistakes. So to the question about Tehran, we know that there are growing ties um, between uh, between South Africa and, and, and Iran, right? Iran grow coming into to, into the BRICS fold. But again, just this narrative against it about it being us against them. And in the absence of, of leadership and genuine diplomatic um, engagement, at an eye level, um, this is these these alliances will be further entrenched. I fear. Would there be any way? And I am just bringing in a follow up question: uh, <laughs> What can the West do actually to understand the global South better and to strengthen relationships so that we are not drifting into in, in, uh, an era where which which is you know just. A uh, matter of polarization between the global north and the global south. Yeah, I mean it's it's ignoring the issues. I mean, for example, this this better engagement, right? I mean, we're, we're talking of um, the war in Gaza today. We're talking about the war in Ukraine, um, and and the Europeans are waking out of this um, this 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 peaceful period, right? Where where people are, oh, war is back in Europe, um, but on the African continent, wars never stopped, right? The guns haven't fallen silent. Uh, on the African continent. And so there is this element of why are we being ignored? I mean, you look at, uh, for example, the issue around um, the, 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 the the ordering of the world order, the representation. Yes, we now have Africa in the, the, the G20, um, but that took a very long time, right? So where is the African voice? We're not being listened to, we're not being heard, right? And, and there's evidence of that in a number of um, international structures the, the the functioning of the uh, the way the IMF and the World Bank are are configured for example the rates at which african countries borrow on the credit markets all of these things these issues are now compounding and in the event where you have these global crises and africans find themselves and people in the global south find themselves lacking and and basic resources this becomes a challenge so 
leadership is needed right now and genuine engagement where the Western world really says we want partnership at an equal level and we want to listen to you and we'll act on what you're saying so that we can make this world prosperous for us all. So I know we're running out of time. Thank you very much. Yes, I am afraid that we have to leave it at that. So I would like to thank you both, Professor Brandes, Christine Mundwa, very, very much for your insights. Also, big thanks from, from us to the Hessen State Office of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for organizing this event. And to all our participants, I hope you enjoyed the session and we wish you a very, very nice evening. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye.